Hello, are you? Okay. Uh, you remember this slide from uh, last week now, when we uh, discussed about uh, uh, the flow of information between a web browser and a web server, saying that uh, actually the main goal of the HTTP protocol was, was to transfer files, uh, but we also realized that most, uh, in most of the cases, HTML files don't exist really uh, because they are generated by some application. So in this general picture, what happens is uh, that there, there, there's always, or in most of the cases, a uh, web application that generates HTML files. Uh, you can notice that I make a, a different uh, path in this picture from the HTML content uh, and uh, the images. I mean, in, in many cases, it depends on the application. If you are generating some maps or um, image editing tool, things will be different. But in most of traditional websites, uh, images are actually static files that are stored on your server. Okay, you prepare them, you save them in JPEG format or whatever. And so these are really static files that only <clears throat> only need the, the web server to be delivered to the browser. Uh, the dynamic generation is only, in this case, is for the HTML file, which doesn't really exist and is generated on demand. So uh, what, from the architecture point of view, we don't have only to handle the web server part, but also some application logic uh, that is contained into a layer that we call the application server. So the application server or application logic or application layer contains all the programming logic, the instructions, that specify the behavior of a website. Hmm? Uh, the web server is a standard component. You can see that there are, so there is a number of products available on the market or as open source products that do the job of the web server. They can be standard software. They don't need to understand anything about your specific website. They just need to handle over files over the HTTP protocol. So a web server is a standard component. All websites in the world has the same type of functionality as a web server. We see that mm, the most, uh, let's say, used uh, web server is the Apache server, which is an open source project. Um, but if you want to get uh, more updated st statistics about which web servers are more used and so on, uh, you can go to this website, uh, which is a lot of nice information to check. But uh, the, if, if we install a web server, it doesn't specify anything about what kind of website we have. The nature of the website, the content of the, of the website, and the behavior of the website is defined by the HTML file that you put and also by the application logic that you write behind the web server, uh, at the application server layer. So actually, our picture is more like this. The client exchanges information through HTTP with the web server. But for every request, at least, for every request except for static ones, so except for images, for example, or um, style sheets and stuff like that, but for every request for a page, for an HTML page, the web server doesn't have the page ready. The web server needs to call an application script, an application method, a function, it depends on the language. Actually, the detail here depends on the language. But there's some code ready that you have written that uh, with your own logic, because the logic behind, uh, I don't know, Facebook is different from the logic behind Twitter. When you're writing a post, uh, the websites do different things. And uh, so the specific logic is run. It's your code, your instructions, our Python code with the goal of generating an HTML 
to be sent to the server, to be sent first to the web server that, of course, immediately will packet that into an HTTP response and ship it to the browser, okay? So this logic may be some, say, code that generates HTML. So this code can also be influenced by some parameters. For example, when you log in with your name, the name that you enter is a parameter for the application that needs to process that name, maybe also that password, and then decide whether you are accepted or not in the website, okay? So what we learned today is uh, in, in, in our Python environment, how to do, how to create these kind of applications. Hmm? Uh, in general, for heavy duty application, you will have a web server component like the Apache web server, and then behind that, you have your own uh, code. We will do something differently. We will do, a, uh, say, a less scalable approach, a smaller approach, in which the web server will be inside our Python program, hmm? which is good if the application, if the website is not, uh, um, doesn't require too much uh, um, say power or scalability, hmm? because actually the web server will be a bit, a bit slow and, and small compared to the, to the big ones. We, we won't uh, need anything more for the moment. Okay, so how do we work uh, in Python for building web applications? This is a topic for, for today, for this sunny today. Uh, so the goal is uh, how to learn to create web applications in Python, of course, because it's the language that of, the, of our choice. Uh, first of all, and today we'll talk about interactive interfaces, so websites, actually, that you can interact with. Um, but what we learned today, we also will be used in the next weeks uh, for uh, integrating server components. So uh, having a, uh, I don't know, a, a Raspberry somewhere where some, there's some application running and you can interact with this application through web technologies. Hmm? Uh, but not, not for the, today, today we don't need to think uh, about this yet. Hmm? And uh, we want to learn something simple. simple. There's, there are many uh, different, uh, um, say, uh, software libraries to use, uh, and we try to do something simple in order not to spend too much time in learning complex stuff. So uh, if you look, uh, or if you do some search about uh, what can I do uh, for web programming with Python? Uh, you find that inside Python, there is already in the standard library a module that is called simple HTTP server. It's already there, but it's really, really simple. Uh, there are many others. Uh, there are many other tools and libraries which are separate libraries that you can install. One is, which is very fa famous is uh, Django, for example that uh, really is really a complex framework in which you have uh, very powerful, uh, there's a lot of flexibility, but it's also a bit hard uh, to, to, to learn and it requires you to do things in a very specific way. Uh, among these many frameworks, oh sorry, this also did one, among these many frameworks what we choose is Flask. Huh? So the one that we are going to use is the Flask from framework. It's one of the many. I mean, okay? They are different from the syntax point of view. The idea is more or less the same. These two, Cherry Pie and Flask, are simpler on the simpler side, let's say, of the, of the scale, of the complexity scale. scale. The other two are more complex. So we go with Flask. And if you want to have a look, you have uh, maybe 30 of them. And, uh, um, what is our learning path? How will we learn about Flask? Well, the, um, we have, of course, the website that presents uh, uh, the, the, the information, which is, well, mm, very short in many pa passages, so it doesn't provide you a lot of examples or whatever, but uh, uh, at least the, the, the key information is there, it's available there, and the documentation for the function is already there. So we will be the main source. You can also find some books uh, about Flask, uh, mm, 
this one, for example, is good for the first half, more or less, and then the second half it goes on to make a practical example, and if you don't care about that specific website example, then it is, uh, it's not very interesting uh, to follow. Um, so actually, the library that we are going to use is called Flask, but it also includes two other libraries. Now, if you read the documentation, it tells you that Flask, okay, it's a micro framework for Python, whatever it means, and inside it contains a web server, a simple web server. So that's what I meant. We don't need an external web server. We have one implemented in Python. And uh, it's, uh, it's a, actually, it's a separate library, which is mostly invisible to us. We don't need to deal with that, uh, with this uh, impossible to read name. I don't know how to read it, so I won't read it. You can read it if you want. Uh, which is the web server component inside Flask. Okay, sometimes in the documentation, it just tells you, okay, this is uh, some parameter for the word soig or, or what's his name, uh, level, so you understand that it's for the web server. Uh, but in addition to the web server, uh, Flash gives you the notion of, a, of an application. Uh, we will understand later what it means, uh, what this means, uh, um, but in, in a few words, uh, HTTP is a page-oriented protocol. Every page is a separate request, and there's nothing that tells that this, this sequence of five pages are all within the same application. Okay, and from the user point of view, the user sees that it's clicking on different page on the same website on the same application. Uh, from the HTTP server point of view, there is no relationship, no link between these, these pages. Uh, creating application context means uh, having some variable, some information that actually on the server side can be used uh, to share some information, some parameters between the different pages of the same website. Hmm? But it is not something that a web server does, it's something that the application server, in this case the Flask level, needs to do. Hmm? We, 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 we call it uh, handling the sessions. Hmm? So, I've been being able to share some information. And uh, uh, Flask already has some say, automatic stuff, uh, automatic operation that can do for us, uh, so it, uh, so it helps us in writing the code. This is one half. So the web server, the application glue logic, and uh, uh, Flask also integrate uh, a template engine. Uh, we will see it, uh, it's a way, an easy way of mixing HTML code with Python code by separating them in different files. Okay, so that uh, we don't risk uh, of having co um, say complex files that mix, uh, that have some part of Python, some part of HTML, so on. We'll see what it means uh, today with a couple of examples. And so it helps you to separate the writing of the HTML from the writing of the Python code. Okay, let's go uh, into the practical <laughs> details. Uh, to install Flask, it's easy, you just need to install the Flask package, okay? And uh, whether uh, system-wide or on a virtual environment on your, on your machine. And installing the Flask module automatically installs also the web server and also the templating Jinja to uh, libraries. And uh, once I have uh, imported this uh, Flask uh, module, the creating a web application is as simple as this instruction. So I need to import the with the capital F class from the Flask module. And I can create a new web application by creating a new Flask with a given name. So the parameter here is the name of, that we want to give to the application. Uh, the underscore form name is, is a good choice, maybe. And what, what the Flask call does 
hmm, is to create a new web application that we store into the variable app. This web application can be run by calling the method run on the app object. So we first create a web application, it starts uh, stop down. So when the, the application is created, it is not running yet, we need to run it explicitly. When we call the run method, then the web application, the, your program will stop, say, and we start uh, uh, waiting for HTTP re uh, requests. So it starts uh, to do the web server job. So you cannot have any instruction after the run call because they will not be executed anyway. Okay? Um, and from that moment on, the application starts responding to any incoming HTTP request. Uh, it starts by listening for requests on a specific port, a TCP IP port on your computer. So by default, if you don't specify anything else, it will listen to port 5000 on the local host interface. So it will only be accessible by a browser that runs on your machine, which is probably what you want to do when, when you are developing. On a 5000 port, which is probably blocked by the browser, by, by the firewall, uh, and it's not standard, so it doesn't conflict with anything. So by default, uh, you, uh, we, you will activate a private web server on your machine. But if you want, you may customize uh, the way this web server runs uh, by specifying on which host uh, it will bind uh, the, the connection. So for example, if you specify 0000, means all the interfaces on the computer. So from localhost uh, and from the Ethernet connection and from the Wi-Fi connection will be accessible if you specify this and also <coughs> the port number which you want to listen. We, we probably don't want to do it uh, until uh, the application is well debugged. And finally, uh, the, the more interesting parameter or option is uh, debug. So if I add debug equal to true, then the website will, will print information on the console while running so we can it helps us to see which request it gets, uh, what, which errors it gets, it gets and so on. So uh, at the beginning, we will always use it. Of course, when the application is finished, we just remove the debug, um, say, option to make it run faster and providing less information to the users. So this is for the startup. And uh, so in this slide, you have information how to set it up for being a public web server well, we don't look at it now because we, we don't want to do it right now. So the web server is ready to accept requests. Then we need to teach mm, to the application what to do when a request arrives. And we know that the request will be in the form HTTP localhost 5000 slash something, some path, some address, okay? Uh, so the HTTP protocol will manage the first part and will get the request to the server. And then we need to decide what to do on the basis of the final part of the address. Slash home, slash uh, uh, files, slash uh, emails, slash something. So what, what we do is uh, to define many functions Python function, normal Python function, define function, semicolon, uh, colon, and then the body of the function. But uh, we annotate or decorate each function with uh, an attribute that is called the root. Applica app is the name of our application, is the name of the Python object that we got and represents our application. So what we are saying is that when the application recites a request for this address, slash, so the main page of the website, the home page of the, of the website, then this request should be routed to this function index. So we are mapping or routing 
the space, the, the namespace of the URLs, of the web addresses, into a set of Python functions. Of course, if I'm trying to request a different address that, that has no route or no matching function, of course, the, 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 um, the web server will, will give you an error, say, okay, page not found, this page doesn't exist. But if the request is slash, then the control is transferred to this function. It's what we had in this picture. The web server receives a request, and then depending on the address, on the local part of the address, it calls the specific application that we need. In our case, the part of the application that we need is one specific Python function. And what does this Python function need to do? Well, it may do whatever it wants, but in the end, it must generate some HTML. So it will return a string, and this string will contain the, the body of the, of the response. In most of the cases, the body will be an HTML file, an HTML string. So this is the, 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 the basic flow. Uh, we can see it working. Uh, for example, we, we, we create a new project. And in the new project creation wider, you see that on the left, you have uh, the Flask option that will already create a project by uh, uh, creating the necessary directories hmm, and folders. And we call it uh, Flask example, for example. Exactly. Flask, Flask X stands for example. So I want to create a new Flask application with this name. Open a new window. Okay. And uh, it creates, no, PyCharm creates me already one file and two directories. One file that is called the flaskx.py, which is the main application file. And two directories, empty directories at the moment, that, is called, that are called static and templates. We see what they, what they are for. And then it also gives me the skeleton of the main program. From Flask, import Flask, create the application. Application is Flask name. And then define all the routes. One, for example, for the main. And uh, we give the name of a function. In this case, it's called hello world. And the run of the application. So this is the basic uh, instruction. This is already a complete website. If I want, I can run it. Uh, so if I take this file and run, It tells me that uh, when the, the execution goes to the run of, to this line, the uh, web server starts and tells me the, that it's running on HTTP localhost 5000. If I click on this link, I open my browser, and I get this hello world page. So what happened? It happened that uh, the web server is running. I opened the browser. I made a, an HTTP request to this uh, web server with the, the slash, with the, I didn't have any local part of the path, so it matches the, the home page. Matching the home page means that the request is routed to this function, hello world, and this function returns a simple string. It should return a complete HTML page, huh? but for the moment it's just a string of text to make it smaller. And this string of text is sent to the browser, which then displays it to the user, and the loop is closed. Okay? If we want to change it, we need first to stop 
the web server, stop the application by clicking on the red uh, square or by hitting Control C uh, in the console, and then modify the, the code and run it again. Because until you stop it, it will still run forever. And so if you change something, it will not get the, the change immediately. If, uh, as I said, if I try to read some other page, I don't know, home, it gives me, it gives me, it gives me an error because there's no route defined for the home local address to any function. So only the routes that I've defined are working. You see that the, the get home request, here in the, in the console, the web server is printing all the requests it gets. It got a request for home, and it replied with 404, which is which means not found. Hmm? Okay, so before we go further, let's just add here the debug. True. No, 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 this one. Debug will equal to true to our web server. It doesn't change anything uh, normally, but it will print you, and in the response, uh, the the, post, the Python ex exceptions, if, so, if for some reason the code you're writing crashes or has syntax errors or whatever. So it makes uh, your error programming mistakes more visible. Okay. What can we do? Well, we can try to create a very uh, ugly application in our example project, okay? The, the wake up uh, application. For example, we wanted to uh, be composed of two different pages, for instance. One is the welcome page, the home page. And the second is a detailed page, an about us, a description page, or something like that. And we want to link them together. So, uh, first of all, we should create the HTML code for these pages. We should decide at which address these pages will be published. So this will be probably the home page. And this will be an about us page. We define the name of the path and the name of the function, the Python function, that we use to implement those. So actually, I can decide that this page will be called index.html, and this page will be published at the about.html URL. So there are two different HTML files. Then we may add links between the two pages. But first, let's create them. Okay? So creating the first page, for example, means creating one new route that routes the slash index.html address into a function that we call index, for example. So we have the public location of the page, so the local part of the URL, what is the address that we want to pay a publish this page at, and the name of the page. Remember this name because we, will, we use it later. So index is the name from the programmer point of view of the page. Index slash index.html is the name from the user point of view, from the browser point of view. Okay. And what do we need to do in the index function? We need to return a string that contains the whole HTML page corresponding to this sorry, picture to the left part of this picture. And uh, an HTML file into a string, so we can use the triple quoted string syntax in Python to make uh, long strings that span over um, several lines. 
and we need to write, write the HTML syntax, for example, writing like uh, the file starts with HTML and ends with slash HTML. It has a heading, heading part, head, slash head, with inside maybe a title, uh, welcome to uh, wake kill. And then we have a body, slash body, with, uh, um, what do we need to have? A title, so H1 is a title, ambient intelligence 2016, slash H1. Then we have uh, a welcome to the wake kill project, which is a paragraph of, of text. End of paragraph. That should be a picture and a link uh, below. And so another paragraph of text, uh, so an image here. And a paragraph of text uh, at the end uh, with the copyright symbol and the smart rooster. Let's forget about the image for the moment. So this, I wrote a fragment of HTML, I hope it's right, inside the string in the Python code. So I'm embedding a language into another. If I run the application now, and I, in the browser, I call for the index.html, index with an X, I get, of course, the page that I just designed. Okay, so index.html gets routed to the index function that returns this fragment of text. Uh, this fragment of text is a, formatted as HTML, so the browser may interpret is it, it may interpret this text as HTML and, brow, and uh, show this in a different font because it's a title instead of a paragraph. And the copy symbol is translated correctly. If I look at the source, I get exactly what was behind the the, the, the triple quotes in Python, uh, spaces included. These spaces here come from these spaces there. So as it is, it's transferred there, and then the browser just renders it. Uh, in many cases, what you want to do and uh, is to avoid all these new lines and spaces, you can write everything to one, one single long line you know, by deleting uh, all the unneeded space. But really it becomes unreadable if you do that. Hmm? So if you change it, and uh, I refresh the page, nothing changes on the web page but the HTML code is different. So for example, because the, the spacing is not relevant in the HTML code, so I can remove it maybe to reduce the size of the download or for other reasons. Okay, uh, about an image. Uh, we know that images uh, should be linked from the web page using the image tag in HTML, and the browser will uh, activate a new HTTP request for getting the, the file corresponding to the image. Okay, what we want to uh, avoid is uh, to route the images. So I have a, a file with the image of, of the rooster. I want to tell uh, Flask to the library, well, this request doesn't need to be routed to a function. This request is for a static file. 
just reply, respond with the file, with an HTTP response, con response containing the file. Don't activate any Python function. It's not dynamic. So that's, that's the reason why the static directory exists. Every file that you save into the static directory can be directly served over HTTP by the web server without being routed through the Python functions. So I remember having a copy of this file somewhere, maybe here. Copy, let's see if I can paste it. Was here. Okay. This is the image. It's a JPEG file that I saved inside the static directory of my web application. So I need to link the file from the HTML code. So this image source is a uh, slash stat static slash rooster dot jpeg and if I reload the page now I have the image in, on its place mm -hmm. so we see that we have two requests and the web browser, when the debugger will tell us, there is a first request for index.html, which gets processed by the index function. Once the HTML arrives to the browser, the browser will ask a second request, static rooster, that is inside the static directory, and so doesn't need to be routed through a function. And so the file is copied immediately is served immediately over HTTP. Okay, so all the files that don't need the processing, Python processing, you just put them into the static directory. Images, style sheets, uh, script, JavaScripts, uh, and so on, other stuff, PDFs, uh, zip files, whatever you need to download. And everything can be put into the static and it can be just uh, accessed with a slash static uh, URL. Okay, now we need to create the second page, the about page. So let's define another one. Route the about.html page, HTML page, on the def function that we called about. And we do the same. We return a bunch of HTML, which will be different, probably. So I copy it, and then uh, it's not welcome to wake kill, but uh, about but wake kill. About us. Smart router. Okay. And then we say. This is a great project. We don't need the image anymore. And uh, we can write, try our project. I save. And if I try to read the about, I get this out. OK, nothing new. Now I want to link them to make uh, this uh, smart rooster footer to be a link to the other page and uh, vice versa having a link back. So I use the HTML to convert this uh, text into an anchor for a link. So the HTML is easy, just A for anchor, href for HTML reference, slash A, and I put here the address of the page, about.html.
and uh, we can do the same, try our project. We can make it an anchor by linking to index.html. Slash A. So if I didn't make any typing mistakes, if I reload this page, we see that this became a link. If I click this link, I go to the other page and, and back. Okay? So this is the basic functionality. We already have a working website, which by the way is very stupid, because we are for every web page is made from a static string. So we don't really need an application server here. There's no logic here, just HTML files. Okay? There's nothing dynamic here. They are just, we have, instead of having separate HTML files, uh, we have separate uh, Python strings that contain the complete HTML code. Hmm? But then we just need to build strings. So if we want to build this, instead of writing by hand a constant string, to build a string by concatenating different parts, uh, by changing some parameters, some information, we can do that. As long as we, we can do whatever we want inside this function, as long as we return the HTML text. Um, there is something, we, we need to improve this. Because for example, here we are within a string. There's nothing that helps us in checking the HTML syntax. So if we do a very small mistake somewhere, it gets undetected until we refresh the page and we see that the page looks weird. Because the PyCharms doesn't understand, doesn't know that I'm writing HTML code. Also, there is a lot of uh, embedded information there. For example, slash about the HTML is the address of this web page. And this address is declared here. If, by chance, I need to change, to, to modify this address, then I need to go all over the strings in my, all my application and find where I, I'm linking to that file. So I'm embedding static information about the names of the web pages. Hmm? And so it will be very difficult to change them, to make the website evolve, create new functions. Because every time I add or modify a page, I need to check all over the source code whether that page is referenced some, somewhere. So Flask may help us by giving us some uh, um, facilities for automatic generation of the URLs, of the addresses. We see that it gets more, more powerful when these addresses will become parametric mm -hmm. at the end of, of today. So uh, instead of writing about.html, we can call the function URL4 and give to this function the name of the page. Remember, the name of the page is the name of the function. In this case, it will be about. And uh, Flask will do the automatic conversion from the name of the function to the name of the route that is needed to call it. So if we need to change the HTML names, uh, it will all be adapted dynamically. So for example, let's forget about doing writing about.html. Let's just try to write, uh, uh, we need to come out from the string and then add URL for index. No, oh, sorry, about.
So what did I do here? I had this, I broke the HTML page in two. I cut, I found a cut point here. And uh, so I closed the, I have this triple closing quote here that closes the string. There is one fur part, and then I concatenate another small string that contains the address of the about page. And then I open the string again and concatenate the last part. So I'm, concat I'm creating the, the HTML page by joining different pieces of strings, some static, some dynamic. Of course, URL4 needs to be imported. So, e before getting used, which is, of course, part of a flex package. So what changes? Well, apparently nothing, because I always get, if I see the HTML code, I always get about.html here. But now this about.html address is being generated dynamically. So if I happen to change this from about to about new, for example, because I need it, the website will still work. The page is different, but the link is being automatically updated. So the idea is never write link explicitly, always, let's go back to the original form, Always use this uh, URL for, for asking Python to generate the URL for you. The same goes here, index. And there's also a format for generating URLs for static files. We have the image here, for example. And the format is URL4, and with the name of the file is static, and the second parameter with the file name. So we change this to, so one, two, three, concatenate URL for static file named, file name is rooster.jpg, jpeg. And everything still works. The image is still there, okay? So, for the sake of uh, easier regeneration, or modify or modification. No, you can here have rooster.jpg, but you can also imagine having, for example, a, a Python dictionary with a lot of different images, and you just pick one dynamically every time will be different. For example, so right now we are we are no longer uh, freezing things uh, into static strings because we have uh, some places where we can change the content of the page. So we have uh, Python fragments where we can change the content of the, of the page. We have Python fragments inside HTML strings uh, inside Python functions. Hmm? And these are for a very simple website. So, imagine a very complex web page. And a complex web page may be hundreds of HTML lines long. Most of these lines will be static, always the same. And here and there, you will have some dynamic parameter, then changing information. So you have a long bunch of strings with small, or even not so small, uh, Python instructions here and there. 
it will become totally unreadable, right? So we need to find a way of getting result. So a Python code that generates a strings that includes uh, dynamic fragments based on Python, but in a more readable and more manageable way. Hmm? So if you agree that we need this, we can see, we skip a part that we, we will, uh, so there's a small direction compared to, to the slides. We go ahead and then we come back to these slides later when we will understand better what they need, who they are for. Let's, let's skip to the templates. Templates are the way hmm, that uh, Flask gives us for creating websites with this, let's say, more flexible way and also clearer. So embedding HTML in Python strings with uh, small Python fragments inside the strings is, is ugly. No? It's error prone, it's complex. You must open and close the quotes and you have the HTML quoting and uh, you see, you notice that, that here you have uh, image source, it's an open HTML tag. Image source, open single, a single uh, apostrophe, uh, single quote, sorry. Uh, it's opening an, a tag inside the HTML page. Then I have a triple double quote that closes the string in Python. Then this single quote is a string in Python, not in HTML, that closes here, another here. Then I, I open the Python string and they close here the HTML tag, the HTML string that they open there, and then I close the HTML tag. So I need to keep track of what's open and closed and something in Python and something in HTML. Hmm? So it's very easy to make mistakes here. Uh, so the solution is templating. So separating a page template, and the template by definition contains uh, the static parts of the page, the parts that don't change, don't need to change, are always the same, so maybe the template, from the changing parts. And the templating engine, which is this part of the library, will uh, interpolate, will substitute for the variable parts of the page, the Python variable, variables or expressions that we provide them. So to see it in practice, for creating a template, we create one file with an HTML extension inside, guess where, inside the template directory, okay? And inside this uh, directory you can have, uh, okay, it's an HTML file. Can be just a direct HTML file. But if that file should contain some variable parts, you can put them into the HTML file with this special syntax. And this is the templating engine syntax. For example, you can have uh, any Python expression, so any function in Python that returns a value inside this double curly uh, parentheses, curly braces, and the value of this expression, whether it's a number, whether it's a string, even a long string, a piece of HTML, will get inserted in that, in that precise place, in that specific place, by removing the, per, the, 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 the template expression. Or maybe the simpler case, the expression is just a simple parameter, the value of a simple variable, variable a name of a variable. Hmm? And the value of that variable will be printed there, will be inserted there at that point. Hmm? So we call interpolation this mechanism. Huh? So we interpolate inside the HTML some specific values in some specific points. This, if you need the, to insert values, but the template engine may also control 
for example, the repetition. Imagine you are building a table of elements. So there are some portion of HTML that needs to be repeated. Table row, table data, or a list item, you must repeat it many times. But every time with a different argument. So we need a, you need a way to iterate, not to repeat a given fragment of, of text. So uh, the templating engine has uh, some control statements that can be used to control the flow of execution of the page. Uh, so you can, so these are, for example, some statements which are not real uh, Python syntax. Hmm? Uh, the main reason is that inside templates, uh, spaces don't count. So you can't use the indentation that you use in Python to mark the beginning and the end of a, of a for. For example, a for statement is similar to Python, for variable in list, but then you need an end for statement to close it. In Python, you don't need it because you just, you just drop the, the indentation and the, the loop is closed. But just minor syntax uh, uh, differences. Uh, let's see what to do here. So I can convert these ugly strings into nice looking templates. I just need to create one file, an HTML file here in the template directory and call it uh, index.html. .html. Okay, PyChance already gives me a nice HTML template where I just need to copy the ugly parts from our old and then all the body. The body goes from here to there. And whenever I need to do some Python code, I can use the double brace syntax. So for example, this is the HTML code, image source. I, I don't know the source of the image. I don't want to hard code it there. So I can call the URL for function. As I said before, any expression can be written. An expression includes calling some function that returns a value. So uh, you can call, say, okay, this URL, the, 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 the argument of the source statement in HTML, is the result of this URL for function that returns a string and this string is interpolated there. And the same is done here. So we don't need explicit, explicit opening and closing strings or explicit concatenation. Wherever we need a variable part, we just write it like uh, opening a window in Python. Now, these double braces just open you a small Python space in which you can write what you want uh, to be displayed in the page. And this is just a template. How can we use this template? The template can be used uh, from the function here, so we don't need to build the strings in this ugly way uh, directly in our Python function. We have a template, so we ask the templating engine, please run this template and give me the HTML. And there's a method for that, which is called render template. So render template, of index in the name of the of the file. Render templates need to be imported, of course. Uh, 
So what we are doing here is we receive a request. The function. This function calls this uh, template engine on this template. So of course the name of this template may be the same of the, as the public page or may also be different, it's, it's our choice. So we have a very say, simple and easy to read the function in Python. This is just all Python code, clean. And an HTML file, which is mostly HTML file with some expression inserted here and there. And it should work as before. If I run the web server again, okay, some little spacing has changed because now we have a, a proper uh, HTML template. <coughs> and you see the result is practically the same as before. Doc type uh, language uh, was inserted by PyChance where they created a new HTML file, so it's some placeholder that were already there, and uh, has the same page. If we want to make the page nicer, if I have, if you have one friend that is very good at, at graphics, and very good at HTML, you can give them this file only, the, the index file, the, uh, the index.html file. This is just basic HTML with some placeholders here and there. So you can improve the, the layout of the page, how the page looks like, without knowing Python. And you can improve the logic of your application. Right now, we don't have any logic yet. But by working in Python without even looking at HTML. So this is. A powerful principle is called the, the separation of concerns. One is concerned with the layout of the page, and the other is concerned with the logic of the application. So we do the same for the second page, very quickly, about .html. We do this conversion. Take the body. And uh, interpolate the link. Like that. And so we can remove also this ugly string from the second function and replace it with a render template about the HTML. You may also, have, so let's check that it works. Oh, there's something wrong there. So what did I do wrong? Yeah. Okay. The easier part is that when you change the template, you don't, you don't need to restart the web server mm -hmm. because they are they are just pulled up on, on demand instead of the Python code that needs to be um, read again by the interpreter. Okay, uh, you can do slightly more. For example, if you want to, uh, if you want to change uh, this page and say, okay, copyright Smart Rooster 2016, this year, but maybe this number we want to increase. Now we want it to be automatically increased, for example. Hmm? So we can do that in Python code and pass this value to the page to be inserted at the proper place. For example, I say that the current year is now 2016. 
just replace it by a complex expression that uh, computes, uh, that queries the date and so on. And uh, we can add one parameter to the template. Say, okay, the copyright year is year. I'm taking a local variable and pass this local variable to the function, to the template, as a parameter. I call the copy year, so the year of the copyright, this parameter. This value, copy year, is available inside the template. So in the index, for example, we can say, okay, copyright, smart rooster, and then copy year. You see that the parameter is already recognized here by the editor because it knows how we call this uh, function. So it become, it's becoming more interesting now. It's not just static HTML, but we can inject uh, every value where you want. It's not just for links. And now you see that it's inserted there. So this is the basic mechanism. Right now, we are still say, a bit limited because the only thing that we know how to do uh, is to make uh, uh, pages with images and links. Hmm? To do something more, we need to add some more interaction where the user can do something because otherwise the application has little to do. Hmm? The Python application uh, doesn't have much work to do. But the, the general, say, approach would be always this one. We prepare the templates for all the pages that we want. So we just, say, imagine starting from scratch now. We want to make a website. So first of all, we try to think about uh, what we want. For example, something like that. We do on a piece of paper uh, the sketch of the website. Okay, what are the pages? How do they link to each other, and so on. Then we give a name to every page. The index page, the about page, and so on. For every page, we then start developing a template, and then start writing the Python function that generates that page. In the simplest case, in the simplest case, the Python function will be just calling the template, like this. In more complex cases, of course, the Python function may need to validate the username, the password, generate your code, and so on. So we have the logic here, uh, to worry about the logic here, and to worry about uh, the page layout uh, in each individual template. You can start with very basic templates, and then you can improve them without touching the logic, and so on. Okay. As I said, the, um, the template language also has some the powerful operators or uh, statements on its own, huh, which are different. Uh, so you can have a look. Uh, For example, let us let me use this address. Ah, I lost it. No. Yeah, sorry. Hmm? You can create loops uh, and so on inside the, so for example, here we have an example of how to create a loop for creating a list. For example, imagine you have a collection of users. So users may be a dictionary, a list, a list in general, a collection in Python. You pass this collection as a parameter to the template, and you want the template to print every user in the list. So you make a, a, a user variable iterating over all the elements of the collection. This is the same thing that you are doing in Python, basically. And for every 
iteration, you write a list item. So you are replicating this code many times, one per each variable, one per each value of the of the collection. And each time the user variable will point it to a different user, like in normal iteration. You are extracting the name and inserting it there. And uh, the same happens here for iterating through dictionaries, for example. Key value and so on. So you can loop through collections and uh, these are all, are all the uses of the for statement, which is the most complex one. Otherwise you have simple if, so if the user is logged in, write something, otherwise write something else, you have a bit of control. All of this is included inside the template. So the template itself may have a bit of logic to adapt the presentation, to adapt the layout of the page to the current variables, to the current values. And, uh, okay, we don't need about macros and, and uh, and also we can have a, a bit of uh, expressions inside the, the, the templates, which are basically a, a reduced uh, subset of the general Python expressions. But in general, if you are doing some simple Python expression, the same uh, will be uh, valid in, um, also in Jinja. Uh, there, there is something, some small differences, for example, true and false uh, are written with a lowercase letter instead of the uppercase letter which is used in Python. So there is small, some small differences, hmm? but uh, it's, it's minor. You can do some math inside. So imagine that inside the, the braces you have a small, a small, a simpler version of Python to use uh, if you want. Hmm? Uh, the interesting part, uh, you may have noticed in the previous uh, case, in the previous page, uh, no? that uh, uh, when printed the username, there was a user dot username, and then there's a pipe uh, E, no? a vertical bar, and then there was an E. You can apply filters, and uh, uh, these filters may uh, modify the strings in some way. So there is uh, the possibility of uh, taking a, an element, a string, and uh, modifying, applying some modifications. For example, the, what is the E? E stands for escape. So in the case the string contains some special characters in HTML, we don't want to print the special characters there. We want to print the HTML code for them. Hmm? Uh, for example, if, if the username, if, let me do it here. In this template, instead of copy here, I could have written, I don't know, uh, a string which says, 2016 with these uh, arrows, okay? What happens if I publish the template now? This string will be inserted in the proper place. If I read this page from the browser, hmm, what I get is uh, not the uh, actual less than, greater than signs, but the HTML commands for generating these signs in the page. Otherwise, the less than 2016, greater than, would have been interpreted as an HTML tag, which doesn't exist. So it would, be, it would disappear from the page. So this is a Filtering operation, in this case it was automatic because it was just a parameter, may be applied anytime you want, anytime you want, by using these uh, 
uh, um, e filter, escape filter. So what you can do is, you, is to already prepare the data as you want to be printed in Python and then pass as a parameter, or maybe pass some raw data directly the Python data structures and let the template extract the single information as you want it. The idea is that the, and we'll understand it when we do something more complex, the Python code should not have any knowledge of HTML. So if there is something, some, something specific to the HTML page, it should be left to the template to handle. For example, if I have a user with a name, first name and last name, okay, I just want to pass the user variable to the page, and then the page will break the first name and the second name in different columns, for example, if it's a table, or in different rows, if it's a list, or whatever. I don't want to prepare it or to break it down in pieces in the Python code. I pass the Python objects, the Python variables, directly to the template, and then let the template handle the, um, the layout, which is more flexible, because the layout probably will, will change, we will make it better, and we don't need to, to change how we manage our, our variables. Okay, so right now, we can do, I say, most of what uh, is possible to do, unless uh, we require some user interaction. So the next step for us will be to let, uh, for example, the user write a login into the page. Uh, the, the first basic functionality of any website will be recognizing the user. So we start to some very simple interaction, the user enters a name, recognize it, we save it, and we modify the page according to the user. We can do that after the break. 